Hello, Rick Gideon here. I want to address the false doctrine of free moral agency. You're a free moral agent. This is another lie from you know who, right in front of you. Orthodox, mainstream, Roman Catholic, Trinitarian, even majority monotheistic Christianity, that you're a free moral agent and you can make right you can make right decisions. We'll get into that a little bit. Well, like say number one, you have the ability to or everyone has the ability to make the choice of getting saved in this age. That's simply not true. The truth of the matter is you are a filthy, rotten sinner with filthy nature. You are evil to the core. And you were appointed for that. As we'll take a look at. God is in control. God has a plan. There's a reason for all of this. It's all going to make sense in the end. God says his ways and thoughts are higher than us. It's okay to question these things that you have been taught by, best I could do, sweaty, orthodox, Trinitarian, monotheistic ministers who love orthodox doctrines. Now they teach you lies continually. Thought I'd just throw that in. This is the age, the end of the age, obviously. This is the age of not the not the scholar, not the wise, not the prudent, but for the babes. God is rejecting the so-called scholars. Those who teach for pay. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 30. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. Actually, Jeremiah 23, I think 13 or 14. They prophesy by Baal. And the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? Well, if you're one of the 10% that survive what's coming upon this nation, you're going into captivity. You will wish you were dead rather than alive uh, with the other 90%. So are we a free moral agent? No. That's orthodox lies. You've inherited lies by the false pen of the scribe. This is an old article I did, like back in 2008. There's a lot of scriptures concerning this. I got a few here I want to share with you. Uh, this quote was from an, actually an Orthodox minister I heard. Man's righteousness is as far away from God's righteousness as man's evil is from God's righteousness. That just blew me away, this article. Well, let's... Let me get into it a little bit here. I pose the question, is man a free moral agent? Who in his life chooses to be good or bad and make the free will decision to accept Christ as Savior? This is an e this is this 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 doctrine right here. The God is trying to save everybody in this age right now. It's just an well, it springs out of the, obviously, the orthodox model of the gospel, which is extremely evil. All these doctrines are from another being that opposes God and his son. And it's given a name called the synagogue of Satan, Jezebel. Okay. And know the truth of God, or are we unable on our own volition, able to choose these things? The answer is that we are not free moral agents, but we are, as Paul said, we have been sold under sin. That's Romans 7, 14. We're given a nature that is through and through sinful and evil, when especially we compare it to the righteousness of God. 
Okay, let's notice what King David said, and I, I mentioned this. I mean, I bring it up, Romans 3, 11. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. You want an example of that? Uh, he's talking to you. Like Paul, a chief sinner. I should have been killed off long ago. Now well, I'm still here. How about this scripture here? Jeremiah 17, 9, describing the moral state of the human heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? How about that? And again in Jeremiah 10, 23, the moral state of man is revealed. O Yahweh, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man to direct his own steps. We're talking morally here. Yeah, you can make good decisions, but overall, you're a filthy sinner with a filthy nature. You don't choose God. God chooses you, as I will witness. Hey, how about the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 3? King Solomon, wise King Solomon here, testified the state of man's heart and mind. Truly, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, well, they go to the dead. How about that? All right, let's get, well, look at another scripture here. Genesis 8, 21, after the flood. This is what God said. And Yahweh smelled a soothing aroma from Noah's sacrifice. Then Yahweh said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. How about that? You're an evil being. <laughs> we were all enemies of God by wicked works at one time, and we all walked according to the God of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. We all had a father at one time, if you're out of this system now. We weren't, we weren't, we, you know, we look at the, that's, well, that's another thing I'm going to touch on. We look at these Pharisees and Sadducees and that, wow, they're of their father, the devil, and the lusts of their father they will do. Well, you know what? We were all children of the wicked one at one time. It's only by the mercy and the grace and the plan of salvation, which is in actually three phases, beginning with Christ. Then the first fruits, then the then the great in gathering, Hoshana Rabbah. Going to hear that more and more from me. Okay, how about this one? Matthew seven and ver verse eleven. This is a great one. Okay, this is a great one. Jesus said, <laughs> "This is what Jesus said to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. If you, you're talking about the disciples. If you, being evil." Know how to give good, give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father, who is in heaven, know how to give good things to those who ask him? Well, how about this one? Even more condemning. John 8, 44. This is the one here. This is all of us at one time or another. Or if you're not in Christ, you. Uh, this is still you. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. You know what? There's a sin I've been working on at work. I tended to grumble and complain. You know what? That's slander. Go read what happened to Miriam when she slandered Moses. God made her a quote-unquote leper, uh, one with Sarat. That's really deep. Uh, sin comes from the inside of the man and comes out. That's something I'm going to address uh, in the near future. does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. There's no truth in us. Our heart is evil, desperately wicked. 
When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And we are all of the serpent seed at one time or another. These, these scumbags had nothing over us, nothing over me, nothing over Paul. The Apostle John testified also, 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. I must have left out John 12, 9. Satan who deceives the whole world. How about that? We were all deceived and are deceived at one time. Oh, I have it here. I'm sorry. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of all, old, the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world. How about that? Holos, whole. Everyone, everybody, you, me, all deceived. How about that? How about Isaiah 64, 6, 7? But we are all like an unclean thing, uh, like a woman's uh, menst uh, menstrual rag there. How about that? And all of our righteousness are like filthy rags, and there is no one who calls on your name who stirs himself up to take hold of you. So much for your free moral agency there, buddy, pal, ladies, gentlemen. Okay. This, <clears throat> the Hebrew word there for um, rags uh, implies treachery and deceit and also a woman's uh, menstrual rag, I do believe. It's a long time since I blew the dust off this article here. So, uh, King David, Psalm 39.5. Behold, thou has made my days as a handbreadth and my age as is nothing before you. Truly, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Eh, you're, a bunch, you're, you're, a piece of, you're a piece of junk. And God, uh, uh, well, you, you, you are a result of that for a reason. God's... He's, he's in control here. God's in control. So I'm going to go down here. Let's read about uh, uh, Leviticus. Everything was clean, unclean. It seems like everything you almost did, it ended up, you end up being unclean in Leviticus. Well, that, that, that's just trying to show you a reminder of your state. You're in a continual state of sin. You were made a sinner, appointed, as we will see. I'm just briefly going through that. This one, of the, uh, one of the themes, I main themes of the Old Testament, Old Covenant, Old Testament, were shadows of what was to come in the New Covenant, New Testament. The Old Covenant is the letter of the reality of the shadow of the New Covenant. This section of the Bible is none other than the shadow of what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7. And you did something that was unclean. It's just to remind you. These things will be instituted in the kingdom, by the way. Reinstituted. How about Romans 7, 14, 25? For we know that the law or the, the law or the Torah is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. How about that? Sold down the river. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate that I do, because you're a sinner. You're not a moral agent. If then, if you think so, you deceive yourself, as John says in John chapter 1. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. That's why you're going to have your flesh circumcised off you on your appointed eighth day, resurrection. Well, now the uh, those in the second resurrection will be raised on the last day of tabernacles in their flesh. They will appear. They will in in the consummation age on the eighth day. They will be. Uh, they will have your their flesh circumcised off them. That's that's coming up a modification. I'm learning. I'm growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
Okay. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, the evil that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law within my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity to the, of the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with my mind I myself serve the law of God, the law of God, but with my flesh the law of sin. That's why when you're crucified with him, the flesh comes off of you. You're no longer in the flesh. You're in the spirit. You're raised with Christ in heaven. Colossians 3, 1, 2, Ephesians 2, 6, 7. You no longer have to keep the physical Sabbath. You're in the spirit of the Torah. Your, your rest is today. <laughs> Continues to today. Deep stuff. How about the, crimp, the, the, the clinching scripture here? Romans chapter 8, verse 6, 7. For to be carnally minded is death, and the natural man is carnal and carnally minded, I wrote. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Going on here. Because the carnal mind is enmity or hostile against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. How about those Israelites that were examples uh, to us on whom the, the end of the ages have come? How about it? Hey, thank an Israelite when he's being thrown into, uh, into uh, the flames there because, uh, because of his example uh, as a you know, you get to be saved. That's the, uh, that's the logic of Orthodox uh, Trinitarian and monotheistic Christianity, uh, which I hate, which God hates. Sorry. Yeah. It's the way it is. I'm going to call it like it is. God hates the doc, the Orthodox gospel. It's false. That's the one doctrine that just seems to be so hard to escape. Because nobody goes and searches it out in Moses, which may be my next uh, video on all the scriptures on how how Christ and his disciples went to Moses to expound him uh, to those who uh, they witnessed the Christ too. How about Luke chapter 10, 21, 22? Okay, you can't figure it out on your own, my friends. You think you can, but you can't. The, Bi the Bible's a coded book. Maybe I will go to Isaiah 28. Here, Luke uh, tw chapter 10, 21, 22. In that hour, Jesus began to rejoice in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven uh, and earth, that you have hid these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Well, he did that 2,000 years ago. He's doing it again in these latter days. He's rejecting the wise and the prudent. This movement coming by the 144,000 will not be at the hands of the wise and the prudent. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son. Okay, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. How about that? You don't find God. God finds you. You get these Orthodox and uh, Trinitarian and uh, remember Anthony Buzzard listening to him. Oh, well, he doesn't really mean that. Uh, you know, God commands that all, uh, uh, what's the scripture, Acts 17, what, 31. God commands everybody now to repent. 
And Paul said that on the air on Mars Hill, the air of Fargus. Over in America, there's 20 million Indians that didn't even hear the so-called gospel until 1,500 years after Paul said that. You know, I think Ephesians 2.10 clarifies that more. Those in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth, and each in their appointed times. 1 Timothy 2, uh, verse 6. How about that? Here a little, there a little. Now notice this. John 6, 44. Jesus testified to the Jews after he blinded them. They wanted to make him king. They were starting to get it. He comes back with the most mind-blowing parable of eating his flesh and drinking his blood with no explanation because he never explained any parable, which he, that, he spoke nothing but parables to the masses. Even most of his disciples fell away. So this guy's nuts. This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, to the Jews, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draw him or her, and I will raise him up at the last day. Even that term, last day, Ah, it's tricky. Because he mentions the second resurrection as the last day and the first resurrection as the last day. That's a, that's a throw off too. Got to go to Moses to figure that one out. John 6, 65. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. So I concluded here. It is only through the calling of the Father to him through Christ and the power of the Spirit of God in us that we can begin to change our evil nature. And one step at a time, God will give this opportunity to all men. And we will be delivered from our immoral nature through the free gift of God, as Paul testified in Romans 7, 20, 24, 25. Now I'm going to go to Romans 5. We're going to do a little extension here. Yeah, I think I got a couple of these up. No, I don't. Let me just, uh, let's go to Romans 5. How about this? That's real good. Okay. Romans 5. Heavy chapter here. I remember uh, and about three years ago discussing this with a Unitarian, a monotheistic guy, a big destructionist on uh, Facebook. He, this was his reasoning for many be saved. Uh, as many were made sinners, many will be made righteous. And uh, I'll, I'll just leave it right there. He said, well, many will be saved, but in the end, it'll be few. But it still will be few. That's what he said. Many won't be saved, but it still will be few. Well, no, that's what Paul, Paul was. Uh, Paul was steeped in the Torah. He was mentored by Gamaliel, very highly esteemed Pharisee. I think in Acts chapter 5 it mentions that. Also, Paul was a highly educated man from the city of Tarsus. That's why he was a Roman citizen, automatically by birth, because it was a city of highly educated people. This guy was far, he was way above even the apostles, which were deemed unlearned and untrained men. He was pulling from the Sabbaths. He knew. How about here? Verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin. Um, let me just skip down here. So sin entered the world through one man. Verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in a condemnation. Judgment. 
Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. This has already been done, my friends. It's already been declared from the beginning. All have been declared justified. And all will be glorified, each in their own time. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Well, who's the man? All have been made sinners. How about that? Made. Well, let's look at the uh, Greek crew, uh, word here. Kath is tamey. I'm just going off the phonetic spelling here. I'm not a Greek scholar. Kathis Tami. I have no desire to study uh, Greek. Um, I'm looking at prophecy. Every, I'm looking at like world events every day. I'm looking at... I'm all over the place. It means to set in order or a point. This is being made sinners. To set in order or appoint. I set down, bring down to place. I set in order, I appoint. Make constitute. So by one man's sin, many were appointed, more or less. NAS, exhaustive concordance. Appoint, appointed, appoints, escorted, made, makes, put in charge, put in charge, render, set. You were appointed to be a sinner. In your appointed time, you're going to begin to strive against sin, and you're going to build character. As Yahweh, excuse me, not Yahweh, Jesus isn't Yahweh, Yeshua, Jesus, strove against sin to the point of resisting bloodshed, or resisting to bloodshed, excuse me. He didn't resist bloodshed. He, uh, he accepted it. That's how much he strove against sin. It's a character-building process. Our God is a lot smarter than what Orthodox pictures him as. These first fruits are striving against the evils of this world. They have to overcome not only Satan, but this present evil world. That's why they're going to reign with him. In the millennium, Satan's going to be taken away. They'll still have their nature to overcome, their evil nature, but they won't have Satan over them. See, our God is a lot smarter than what, matter of fact, Orthodox, they, they paint him as a complete moron. I can't stand it. That's why I keep doing these videos. You were appointed to uh, be a rotten, filthy sinner, which in you no good thing dwells. Okay. So, stop drinking the wine of Babylon. It's going to be overthrown. All these doctrines of Orthodox Christianity are going to be overthrown. Coming sooner than you think, I think. So, thank you for your time and thank you for listening.